thank you all for participating in the end of the season webinars. I would like to say a big thank you to all our speakers uh, who took the time and the commitment to prepare uh, their presentations and to answer questions. I just want you to be aware that later in the fall, we'll probably have another workshop or so. Uh, we will be looking at uh, how to use our pesticide guides, especially our herbicide guide, and also how to better use our variety trial information. Some of us are well versed in using the pesticide guides and variety trials, but I realize that many of us are also new and do not have the experience of, or maybe even the background um, in using some of those pesticides. So we'll have Joe Eichley and others will kind of discuss how best to use the pesticide guides and how best to understand and use the variety trials to inform producers when they come asking you which varieties to use in specific areas. Uh, today we have Dr. Franzen. Uh, he will be discussing soil for soil fertility and fertilizer for 2023. Uh, feel free to put questions in the question and answer session or in the chat box, and we will have lots of time at the end of this presentation uh, to have follow up questions and discussion. With that, we'll go ahead and you can start, Dave. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Mohammed. So I found through the years that that not only accounting agents, uh, specialists, but uh, certainly farmers and many crop consultants, the thing they know the least about is soils and and, and fertilizers. And uh, so don't don't feel alone if uh, if some of this is is kind of beyond you right at the beginning. So I'm going to try to try to make this as basic as possible to get you get you a start on answering some basic farmer questions uh, that you'll have to answer or that may come up uh, this fall and, and this com coming winter. So this is kind of an outline about what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, soil testing, these are basic soil testing, where to find our crop root nutrient recommendations, and then a little bit of detail on our nitrogen, phosphate, potassium, and some other recommendations as we go along. So I want to start out with soil testing. So this is this is the basis of almost all of our fertilizer recommendations. So if a farmer comes to you and, and kind of wants to know what to do about fertilizer, uh, the basic answer, I think I'll do what I did last year is, is usually not the best answer because uh, things change from year to year. So to start out, soil testing is important and soil testing by zone, I think, is the way to, to do things in, in the state. The depth of core is important. You use a zero to six inch depth core for surface nitrates, phosphate, potash, organic matter, surface salts, which is expressed as EC on the soil test, uh, zinc and soil pH. Uh, the others, uh, the tests are horrible or they're not important. The six to 24 inch depth is an additional depth and that's calibrated for nitrate in. And then uh, if they're growing barley, malting barley, uh, chloride might be important and you take it on that depth too, the two foot depth. And then subsurface salts and sometimes subsurface acidity, especially out west where that's a major problem. So start out with the depth and then the next step is how do you take the sample? The, the, the way I would prefer that people would take a sample in this state is to zone soil test. It's uh, the dominant precision ag way to, to soil sample a field. And, and even if site-specific nutrient application is not possible, it, it reveals some odd areas in the field that, that may mask the the availability of, of a nutrient. So this is a sample, this is just an example of, of, of a field where cores are taken throughout the field. And if each core was analyzed individually, it shows up there on the left. Uh, but those those values usually have a spatial relationship, either 
uh, they're on some high ground where you can't grow a crop and so the nutrient rate accumulates or it's on the low ground where where nitrate might seep in and, and accumulate uh, but they they tend to be localized into areas that are dominated by the by the landscape of a field so i found early on in my north dakota days started in 94 uh, this is a 40 acre field with samples taken every quarter acre roughly and I got this nice little pattern in the middle that I called the horse head pattern. I think you can kind of see what I'm talking about there on the left. And and then when I sampled it in 95, I didn't expect to see the same pattern, but I did. And I I saw the same pattern every year for 10 years when I worked at this field. So these these patterns are stable. The values within the patterns are different, but but that that supports the whole zone sampling and. It's been confirmed by all kinds of crop consultants from one side of the state to the other. Uh, I did studies uh, in, in a, over a 12 year period from Montana all the way all the way to uh, the Minnesota River Valley. So the the use of zones in this region is pretty solid. So again, it's related to landscape. This is that 40 acre field I showed you before with a horse head pattern in the in the middle and and here it shows up in in blue roughly and it's uh, surrounded by sandy to loamy uh, ridges and it's the swale in between the forms of horse head but it's all landscape related and it's because of the way the water moves uh, yield differences uh, can sometimes well oftentimes will follow these same patterns you can see the horse head in the middle there in the very dark green surrounded by the low low yielding sandy sandy loamy ridges in some states uh, Iowa's looked at zone sampling and, and they found it useful for their lime and they found it useful for their for their potassium and, and less so for their phosphate and soil test for for phosphate and I mean nitrate and in Iowa it's too warm too wet uh, but we can also use the same patterns for uh, all of our non-mobile nutrients like phosphate, potash, uh, soil pH, and that's because of the patterns of erosion in the field that also affect the availability of those nutrients. So the, the zones you make for nitrate are also very valid for all of the other nutrients as well. So the one sampling fits all. There's different tools and I have uh, publications you can find on my website on the extension publications that go into these in detail. Uh, these are electrical conductivity, they're responsive to salts and other things in the soil. The one on the left is a, a Varus rig. There are several of these in the state. NDSU has two of them, one up at Langdon and one here on the station. And then the one on the bottom right is, is an EM38 and it works on magnetism. But if you remember your high school physics, electricity and magnetism are are mathematically related so it gives you about the same kind of patterns you can also use remote imaging for drones and from airplanes and from satellite images uh, the one on the right is a satellite image and the satellite images we have today are much much more uh, fine-tuned than these that you see here that are about 25 years old uh, so you can see those same patterns if you look real hard you can see the horse head in both of those pictures in this valley city site it's good to have more than one one tool to develop a zone map, and I think most consultants understand this, uh, but uh, there are some that don't, and, and so if they're thinking they can just use a aerial photograph and, and they're off to the races, that, that may or may not be true. It will be if it's lucky, but not. this is a about a 40 acre field up by beach uh, in the western part of the state with the satellite image up in the up on the top the topography in the lower left and then the ec the salt reading and the in the right and you combine these three you have a pretty good idea of what that field looks like and where you need to sample each one of those separately uh, you only get a little bit of a view of what you really need to do so that's that's sampling in a in a very reader's digest version so where do you find our fertilizer recommendations? They've all been redone in the past decade or so. So, you know, if you have an old file that has 20, 25 year old recommendations, pitch them because they're not valid. Uh, they're not right. Uh, the, the ones we have are modern. They use modern data uh, and they uh, new, use modern, uh, modern concepts. They're very scientifically supported. So you can either search for Dave Franz and NDSU, select my homepage, and then select my extension publications and then put that link in your favorites, but you can also do um, 
soil fertility NDSU ag communications and you should come up with that website there on the bottom and, and I think you're going to get this presentation at the end um, that you can have uh, and so you'll have you'll have those that you can that you can use so all the recommendations are are there and most of them are up to date although they're continually being adjusted so I want to get down to the specifics of the of the major nutrients nitrogen phosphorus and potassium are the three most common commonly applied fertilizer nutrients either organically or, or commercially in the in the state the misconception though is that all the nitrogen for crops comes from fertilizer and that's not correct uh, anywhere from only anywhere from 25 to at most 60 percent of the of the fertilizer nitrogen that the plant takes up comes from the fertilizer the the rest isn't lost usually I mean, sometimes it can real wet season but most of the time it's just tied up in different things and and we get a lot of nitrogen from our release from the soil and this comes from process we call mineralization which is the decomposition of residues and soil organic matter uh, we also have release of non-exchangeable ammonia from smectite clays which are clays that are found across the state and they're more common in the east than they are in the west by far there and then also in a long-term no-till no-till systems we we have a credit or it doesn't take as much nitrogen to produce a crop in long-term no-till as it does in in conventional till and part of this at least comes from uh, the work of asymbiotic nitrogen fixing organisms usually bacteria but not all all the time that uh, are supported by by long-term no-till the the limitation that they're to their success is food and housing and there's more way more of each in long-term no-till than there is in conventional till so uh, that's part of the of the no-till nitrogen credit part of the nitrogen in our formulas for for fertilizer for the next year is from previous crop nitrogen credits there's there's a couple of credits that come directly from decomposition of, of plant residues from the previous year, but mo most of the, an, the annual legumes do not. We we have a credit for sugar beet leaves for those of you that might be in the east. If you have green and yellow green uh, leaves at harvest time, uh, these leaves are are pretty rich in nitrogen and rot really fast and contribute nitrogen directly to the next crop you also get this kind of a credit from alfalfa if you happen to terminate an alfalfa crop uh, there's some nitrogen from that crop that's available for the next several years uh, just from directly nitrogen released from the crop residues but the nitrogen from the previous crop credit for soybeans for field peas lentils dry beans all of those annual legumes that it's not from that at all. Uh, those crops don't have much residue to tie up the natural nitrogen release in the soil. Uh, as you, you get that tie up from say corn residues or canola residues or um, wheat residues, certainly any small grain residues, they tie up nitrogen. And you don't get that with annual legumes. And so more, more of the nitrogen that's mineralized from the soil is expressed in the next year. And then also something we know in soybeans, and it's probable also with the other annual legume crops is that uh, those annual legume crops have uh, some kind of evolutionary uh, mechanism uh, that they developed over time as they stimulate the organisms that, that decompose tissues and release nitrogen that mineralization and, and they increase the rate of mineralization so they don't have to work so hard to to feed the the nodules on their roots so that that's where the nitrogen credit from annual legumes comes from it doesn't come from the decomposition of the crop so really yield of those of those previous crops is not important it's just the fact that you're growing the crops is important and it's uh, I think as I recall it's about 40 pounds as a previous crop credit for annual legumes. So our modern nitrogen recommendations, everything that you'll find in, in our nitrogen recommendations in North Dakota is, is based to maximize farmer profits and not necessarily yield. If you put on more nitrogen, you put on more fertilizer, maybe you'll get another bushel or two, or maybe an additional ton, but it'll cost more to produce it than it will uh, to 
to, it'll cost more for the fertilizer than it will for the grain or the or the commodity that you get back. So so why why in the world do you do it? You're, you're putting on fertilizer to make money, and if you don't make money, why in the world are you doing it? So all of these recommendation changes have been have been made with with recent field studies all over the state in in most cases. So if you go to my website on the right hand side, there's a there's a link for nitrogen calculator for corn and spring wheat durum and for sunflowers. And if and and it's all in one. The old one had separate ones for each one, but my my wonderful technician God Hong Gang that uh, develops all these programs put them all into one. And there'll be an app coming out in Android and iPhones in the future this winter sometime, but that's not available yet. So only this one on the that you can get through the web is available right now. So this is the one for corn. And it has a state divided up into four regions, East and Langdon, Central, West. Um, the corn is the only one that divides out the central region. And, and that's just because of the yield limitations of that central region compared to what's in the in the east. There's uh, not as much water, uh, there's more salts, there's all kinds of limitations to maximum corn uh, yields. You can get 250 bushel corn uh, in many parts of the eastern eastern region, but uh, you'd have to struggle to get 200 in the central. So anyway, that's why that's carved out. The Langdon region is carved out on all of our recommendations because the shale that you find in that soil has ancient non-exchangeable ammonia that's released every year and it acts like a slow release fertilizer. So the recommendations are lower in that region. And in the Western region, it's just drier, it's warmer. Those of you that live out there understand all that. And so there's limitations and also it's all, almost all no-till, like 98% is no-till, one pass seeding. Uh, and so it's carved out as a different region and the response curve is different out there. So what, what, what you do, let's see, my thing doesn't work. Anyway, the, you, you choose the closest corn price, you choose the closest nitrogen cost. Percent of organic matter in the soil really isn't important until you hit 6% and then it is. We do have soils that have over 6% organic matter in the, in the soil. And when you hit that, uh, you don't need as much nitrogen. You put in your two foot soil nitrate test as we described before in the beginning slides. You put in the previous crops that you planted and uh, whether it's irrigated or non-irrigated is important also. You click on the region that you're in and then you calculate. So that's the corn one. The wheat one's pretty similar. Uh, wheat price, nitrogen cost, organic matter, two foot nitrate, previous crops. You click on the, the zone you're in and then you also put in the tillage type uh, in the bottom. And when you when you calculate, that's how you that's how you work it. And then the sunflower, same thing. Sunflower, nitrogen, organic matter, two foot soil test, previous crop, region, tillage. And then the sunflower type is important to the oil seed. The nitrogen recommendation is a little bit lower because the higher the end you apply, the lower the oil that you get. And farmers get paid a premium on oil and they get docked if it's below, I think, what, 40%? I think something like that. And then uh, in the confection, you don't have that kind of problem. But the rates are limited because the higher the nitrogen that you apply, the greater risk you have for lodging toward the end of the season after the head develops. And that's a huge deal. All right. So you will find that yield doesn't have any kind of a part in nitrogen recommendations, doesn't have any part in any of our recommendations because the fertilizer rate is based on relative yield. Uh, whatever the environment and soil will give you for a given year. Uh, there just needs to be enough nutrient available so that it doesn't restrict yield. And so the recommendations take that into account. So I want to give you an idea about what why relative yield is important. So this is our data set from all of our sunflower work that we did between 2014 and 15. And it just looks like a kind of a scatter diagram. You can kind of force a quadratic curve into it. I like to see a quadratic curve on a fertility study, but uh, an R squared of 0.02 is pretty horrible. And so what are we doing? Because each of those sites had a real strong relationship to nitrogen. So this is on a 
kind of a simpler scale. This is kind of what we're looking at. So here's that cloud that you can kind of force a quadratic curve on. But really what you're looking at are these almost parallel quadratic curves from a low yielding environment up to a higher yielding environment. So that's what we're seeing when you're seeing that seeing that uh, graph of that really low R squared in the sunflowers. And so what we do is we standardize uh, the data. Uh, for example, we have a sunflower site that that yielded 4,000 pounds in the highest uh, highest yield treatment. So we divide all the yields by 4,000 to reach values between zero and one. Now we have a low yielding site, maybe out Amadon someplace with 1,800 pounds. We divide all the yields in that trial by 1,800. So we have values between zero and one. And we do that with all of the sites so that we get each one standardized between zero and one. And then what we end up looks like that it all collapses against uh, across a quadratic curve and the r squared is a lot higher so i'll give you a couple examples just to make sure that you know you don't think i'm just making this up and so on the right hand side this is western north dakota conventional till wheat sites all of them raw yields and the r squared is 0.16 but that same data we standardize it and put it on the, the standardized yield within the site and total known available and and the r squared more than triples up to 0.53 so that's what that's what's happening that's it's related to, to relative yield and not actual yield and this is the eastern north dakota no-till sites raw yields on the left r squared 0.2 and the standardized same data just standardized r squared jumped up more than three times to 0.68 so it's all relative yield it's not actual yield so yield goal really isn't important this is my favorite one of all time we haven't published this one yet but pretty soon but this is the barley two row barley trial that we've done uh, for a couple of years and if we took the actual yield over on the left the r squared is abysmal 0 0.0059 so our, our recommendation would be you don't need nitrogen for barley which is totally not true but if we standardize each of that data, uh, we have R squared is like 0.55. So it's really, 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 really related to, to nitrogen. It's just relative yield, not actual yield. So it's almost magic, but it's not magic. It's just it's good stats. All right, so why in the world does this happen? And, and people maybe come in and sit down and they'll say, well, you know, my yield goal for wheat is 50 bushels. And you'll say, I don't care. And they'll look at you kind of funny and uh, or more than funny. And before they walk out, uh, you can explain, well, in a low yielding environment, the nitrogen use efficiency is way less and there's less nitrogen mineralization, uh, smaller root ball, uh, and uh, if it's excessively wet, you have a lot of nitrogen loss. And so the result of all of that, either dry or too wet, making a low yielding environment is that it takes far more, far more nutrient per bushel ton or pound than it does in a normal year. And then once in a while, we get a really ideal environment. 2016 was as close to that as I can remember. And the moisture was near ideal, so the nitrogen use efficiency was really, really high. The roots were able to grow to the fur furthest genetic potential, and the uh, nitrogen was moving to the roots by mass flow, and the uh, microorganisms were working overtime, mineralization, and release to the crop, and so it took far, far less uh, nitrogen and other nutrients to supply the crop uh, per pound per bushel per ton than it would in a normal year. And so the net result is the rate that produced the highest economic maximum yields in a, in a poor year is the same rate that's necessary in a really good year. So it yield gold doesn't have any effect. All right, so that's nitrogen and kind of a the same kind of philosophy we use on the other nutrients as well. You, you won't see yield goals anywhere. All right, so phosphate requirements. We have two crops, so we found that the phosphate application is not important, and those are flax and sunflowers. Maybe it's because the mycorrhiza, the fungus that lives symbiotically with many, many of our crop plants, is uh, particularly efficient in those two crops. I don't know, but for whatever reason, our, our studies show mine and others show that phosphate's not needed for those two crops. If you apply them, it's a complete um what 
money down the drain that year, I guess. So, and then a uh, phosphate starter, and by starter, I mean uh, anything that, that's banded, uh, pay, placed in concentration, you know, either with the seed or close to the seed are very important for all of our small grains, for sugar beet, for potato, for canola, and for corn, but that's all. And we don't put starter fertilizer uh, with soybeans uh, because it uh, almost always reduces yield and never increases yield. So that's a broadcast. The one crop that's not here that probably should be here is dry edible beans. If the soil is moist at planting time, a small amount of starter fertilizer and sub-time helpful. But we also know that if you go into a season like last year, not this past spring, but last spring when it was so incredibly dry, um, leave the leave the starter fertilizer off the dry beans because it probably is going to reduce the stand and maybe the yield. But if the soil is moist, uh, it'll improve the dry beans a little bit. But it's not nearly as important as those crops I show up there in the middle, small grains to corn. So that's phosphate. That's a quick one. All right, so potassium uh, requirements are based on clay chemistry. And I'm going into a little bit more detail on this because this is pretty unique. Uh, Minnesota and South Dakota are also working on recommendations uh, based on clay chemistry. And others are looking at it too, but we're the only state so far that bases their K recommendations on clay chemistry, which is unfortunate. So clays aren't just small particles. They're defined as NRCS as being particles less than 0 0.002 millimeters in diameter. But uh, there are some what's called amorphous particles within that, within that fraction of the soil, which means that they're, they're not crystalline, but, but there are a lot of a lot of objects, a lot of particles within that clay fraction that are actually the clay crystals, the clay minerals. And they're formed in sheets of oxidized aluminum and silicon uh, when the magma, the lava cools, and their origin is metamorphic rock, and they continue to this day. So just a little bit of basic uh, chemistry of the clays. The black dots in the middle of those structures uh, are the silicon and then the blue that surrounds them is the oxygen and the black lines are the bonds they're the bonds and so uh, it it forms these sheets a silicon oxide sheet and the silicon uh, SiO4 on the bottom that's the building block but they lock together like that into these sheets and uh, they don't exist uh, independently. They exist uh, in combination with aluminum hydroxide building blocks and the aluminum hydroxide sheets. So there's sheets of silicon bound to sheets of aluminum. And sometimes uh, there's two sheets of silicon on, the, on either side of the aluminum like a sandwich. So this is, this is a one-to-one -one clay, kaolinite. We have a lot of kaolinite, West River. And that's what this looks like. It's uh, the silicon sheets, aluminum hydroxide sheets, uh, semi-bonded together really pretty tightly. There's nothing that can go in between that. And then there's stacks of these on top of each other. And they don't, uh, they're bound pretty tightly and nothing can get in between them. And then there's two to one clays and they look like this. Instead of, instead of a sheet of aluminum hydroxide and one of silicon oxide and then one on top of the other, they look more like a sandwich. And then these sandwiches are piled on top of each other. Uh, but there's space in between them, depending on what the what the ion is that binds them in between. So after all that mess, uh, I think maybe looking at them, it's maybe a little bit more instructive. So the this micrograph on the on the right shows a shows a a clay, kaolinite clay sample. And in the middle, you can see these stacks of, oh gosh, what do they look like? Almost like books. You can actually see the silicon oxide sheets uh, stacked one on top of each other. Look how tightly they're bound. Look how tightly they, they move to each other. These things don't shrink and swell. Uh, they, um, thank goodness they don't, they don't, there's just not kaolinite in the soils in the West. There's also some illite. There's also some smectite in there too that allows a little bit of, of mobility. The slide in the rest is from illite and you can see the clay layers, especially on that, on that, uh, those 
plays on the on the left. Uh, and then there's an indentation in between. And uh, and so those stacks, a smec, a smec type sheet, and uh, I mean, an elite sheet, an elite sheet, an elite sheet. Uh, and then the indentation is the potassium ions that have flowed out in between there, but uh, not very much. You get potassium flowing out of the edges. You get a little bit of curling on the edges, but not much in the middle. So they're kind of semi forgiving, but not really forgiving. Uh, the ones on the right are smectites. There's a lot of space in between the the two to ones clay sheets, and that produces this wavy type of pattern with a lot of space in between the cations and water can flow in and out. And that's why they shrink and swell. They, they shrink when they're dry and they expand when they're wet and they expand when they freeze and they shrink when they thaw. And so they're like accordions, little accordions in there that um, in the soils in the very east that are very highly smectitic, maybe 80% of the clay fraction is smectites. Those are self-healing soils. Anybody that's doing deep tillage in the east is total recreational tillage because the soils till themselves. Uh, there's no no need for any of that. All right. So why is this important in, in potassium? When when uh, those those smectites shrink, they trap the potassium inside of the clays, and, and I think it draws the potassium inside the clays also. And so you have a soil test that you think is going to be okay, and then you get a really dry summer, and then you have potassium deficiency symptoms, as you see. And corn is particularly sensitive to it. Uh, the potassium deficiency symptom is uh, yellowing and necrosis on the bottom leaves, on the edges of the leaves, and the midrib is the last thing to turn yellow. But this does, you don't see this when it's moist, but you see it when it's dry, and that's why. Another source of potassium, especially in the very eastern part of the state, are potassium feldspars, which are another metamorphic type of mineral. Uh, and within those spaces in those, uh, they're kind of like, uh, what, rectangular tubes uh, full, of, full of potassium. And, and so they release potassium over time, too. Uh, people used to think that minerals in the soil didn't really release potassium very quickly, but we know that they do. So they're, they're certainly a source of potassium in areas that do. So potassium nutrition is very, very... Very, very different than probably what you learned in, in your soil fertility class, if you even cover, cover that at all. It's usually the last thing in a soil fertility course, and they spend about 10 minutes on it. They should start out with potassium because it's as complex in terms of physical chemistry as what nitrogen is biologically. So there's all kinds of sources of potassium and all kinds of ways that potassium get tied up or lost. And this is a new paradigm of, of potassium in the soil. So our recommendations are based on smectite to illite ratio. If you have less than three and a half, as you see on the graph on the, on the top, if you have 150 part per million our soil test, you're in good shape. If you have less than that, you need to add some. <clears throat> and if the smectite illite ratio is greater than three and a half with greater smectites in your soil, then the soil test needs to go up to 200 ppm as a critical value. And, and that's all in our recommendations. Potassium feldspar, uh, in the southeast part of the state, we have quite a bit of potassium feldspar, and so that helps keep and maintain our soil tests the way they are. But once you get West, West River, we don't have much at all. And so it all has to come from the from this, what you see in the soil test. So we have a map in all of our all of our recommendations, and this is the less than three and a half or white, and greater than three and a half or the dark color. And that uh, generally lets a farmer know where um, where they stand and what what uh, what their spectite to light ratio is. It's it's very expensive to figure out. I mean, a farmer can, uh, but there are limited labs that that do this work. Uh, we send our our lab our our samples to a lab in Ontario, and if you're interested, and I can give you the information, but it costs over four hundred dollars a sample to have it run and you have to get it through customs, um, which is a little bit of a stretch sometimes. So, but anyway, it, it is possible for a person to do that um, by their own. It's just really expensive. <clears throat>
We have a calculator app that's also depends on the price of the corn and the, and the cost of the potassium fertilizer. Uh, but if you go to North Dakota K calculator app uh, on an iPhone or, or a Android, you can find this and, and you can put in the values and, and figure out what your, what your rate should be on corn. The next thing I want to talk about is, is is pH and liming. It's something pretty foreign to North Dakota, but something becoming way, way important, especially West River, but not only West River, but uh, we have some pretty acid soils in places east of the river too, from the edge of the valley uh, over to Montana. So when we have intensive crop growth and application of any ammonia-based fertilizer, and this includes the manure, it results uh, in the future as as soil acidification. Long term, you see it first. Long term no-till, you see it first because you're not mixing it with soil uh, from down below. But people in conventional till see this uh, pretty soon. But uh, what the the no-till soils of the canary in the coal mine, and, and so we're starting to see that. We have to do this. The remedy is liming, which is the application of any amendment that reacts with hydrogen ions to form CO2 and water. In conventional till systems, liming material is incorporated. Uh, and in no till, it's not it's just laid on the surface. So we don't have a single limestone quarry in North Dakota, which is really unfortunate. In Illinois, where I came from, their limestone was the bedrock that underlay almost all the state. Uh, and here we don't have that. So our source sources are water treatment lime sludge and sugar beet waste lime, and which is, they're good liming sources and they're free, uh, but trucking is expensive and all of our sugar beet lime sources are on the edges of the state and nothing in the middle. You pile it up in the field and then you use an end loader to put it in a spinner spreader can't go through a pneumatic, that'd be death. And then uh, it's it's spread on the field. So our limited research and Chris Augustine and Ryan Vito in particular have been working on this uh, out of Dickinson because that's where the major problem is, is um, I'll conclude that surface liming alleviates the low pH stratification that we see and aluminum toxicity, which we get when the soil pH gets below five. So legumes are particularly sensitive to this, but all crops are to some degree, unless you're growing blueberries and they like it. So this is what you'd like to see with a legume with a pH above five, then the nodules in the top few inches of soil. But when you have a surface pH of four and a half or so and the pH below there may be five, uh, the soybeans and any kind of legume struggles to nodulate in an environment like that. But if we apply lime to the surface, uh, we can get that pH up around six or so, and we start to see the nodules again and every, everything is happy. Uh, North Dakota is not the first state to see this. Uh, Southern Illinois was uh, almost abandoned in the late 1880s because of a acidification problem. Uh, and, in a, and a researcher from, from Illinois uh, found that if they, if they lined these soils, they could put them back in productivity. And he wrote this, this cool circular that's called Wheat from Stones. And there's the cover page on it right there showing the acre of wheat without, uh, without the limestone and the, the wheat that you can grow if you put limestone on. So it, so it made a huge impact on, on that state and all the others. So this is uh, Chris Augustine's work at Minot in 2020. In the foreground, you see the pathetic wheat crop uh, in the foreground where the pH is in the four in the high fours, aluminum toxicity and really low pH problems. And in the background is where it was limed. Uh, and this was incorporated a few inches, but um, uh, this was beet lime that was applied and the uh, yields were hugely better. So this is uh, this is what it what it cost uh, at that time. In 2020, about $50 a ton hauled from Sydney at the sugar beet plant uh, with the zero tons an acre. The P pH was 4.5 with aluminum concentration of 51, which is pretty horrible. Uh, and then with four ton an acre, the pH increased to 5.9 and the aluminum was greatly reduced. So that's what increased the yield 
in those trials. So these are steps. Should sample to zero to three inch and three to six, uh, have the lab run pH and buffer pH on both depths, line up your lime source, schedule the application. It's best to do it in the fall to avoid compaction and apply before freeze up. So I think lastly, lastly, I want to talk about sulfur because that's something that's changed greatly in the past 20 years. Uh, we used to get sulfur from the from the air in the left hand side you can see in the north dakota area you can see all the plumes from uh, the just across the border uh, from crosby in canada where they had the power plant in canada and then you can see the power plants along the missouri river <clears throat> and you can even see some of the beet plants along the red river on the western edge of well along the border you know where the beet plants are and if you look at 2019, you can still see some of that. Um, I don't have a 2022 slide up there, but at that point, they pretty much disappear. So essentially, we don't get any sulfur from the air anymore from almost anywhere. And so that, that means that uh, that's a source that we used to get, and now we don't. The soil test is garbage, so don't even don't even use it. Uh, people use it because people ask for it. The labs run it because people ask for it, not because it's worth anything. So don't ask for it because it's not worth anything. You're going to get sulfur responses if uh, in certain crops, if you if you have a wet fall, if you have a wet winter, wet early spring, uh, especially on sandy loam and coarser soils, anywhere that's been leaching. And uh, we have a lot of those in the state. Uh, and if we have persistent rain in the springtime, you can even see it in soils that have four or 5% organic matter and clay content of 40%. So it, um, it's all a, a factor of the rainfall. Elemental sulfur is not an option. Use sulfate sources. Don't put ammonium thiosulfate liquid with the seed. It's uh, like liquid death to the seed and then consider sulfur for these crops. Absolutely for, for canola, no question, absolutely for canola. Uh, but it's also important for small grains, any small grains in the corn. Any of the broadleaf crops, it's not nearly as important. You don't see the degree of, of deficiency and you don't see the consistency of any kind of return on it. But for the small grains, canola and corn, pretty important. So here's my contact information before we go to questions. And I think most of you know how to contact me. Uh, and, and you should feel free to contact me. And some people kind of apologize when they call and say, well, I'd li like to ask a stupid question. And I say, well, if you're gonna ask it, it's not stupid. It's only stupid if you don't ask it. So, uh, you know, I wasn't born with this information. Somebody taught me, and so it's my job to teach you. And so I want to make sure that things are understandable and that I'm, I'm accessible. And uh, all of us specialists feel that way. Uh, we hear sometimes that people are reluctant to talk to us because, I don't know, we're in some kind of astral plane. And that's not true. We're just, you know, we're we're good at what we do, uh, but we're, you know, we enjoy teaching, and that's why we're doing what we're doing. So... Uh, we'll open up for questions and and thanks for thanks for being here. Okay, so on the Q and A, Lisa Lisa's asking, would grasses and pastures benefit from potassium fertilization? I can hear Kevin saying, "Don't fertilize native range," but curiosity killed a cat. So I think that um, the studies that were done years ago with um, say phosphate, nitrogen, all of those, it, it's really hard to get your money back. And the only the only forage crop that really benefits hugely from potassium fertilization is alfalfa, but certainly our native ranges, uh, all of those, I don't, I don't think they would. We have some pretty high native potassium values in most of our soils, especially in the, in the West. Don't pay any credence to, any recommendation you say that are percentages of of base saturation, those are horrible recommendations. Don't pay any attention to that. Uh, but, al but alfalfa, especially right before you seed it, putting on a, a pretty good amount of potassium is 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 a good thing. But but no, I wouldn't generally just do it. <laughs> 
And then uh, Julianne uh, asks, what's ATS? Don't put ATS with the seed. So ATS is ammonium thiol sulfate. It's 110027S. It's a liquid, smells like sulfur. Uh, and a lot of people put it through their irrigation pivots uh, because you can mix it with 28%. Uh, some people stream it. So if you go in winter wheat or if you're going to stream supplemental material on your small grain, uh, you can mix a little bit uh, in with the with the UAN, the 28%, the 2800, the ammonium nitrate urea solution. All of those are the same. Um, but yeah, ammonium thiol sulfate is a, is a liquid fertilizer and it's a good sulfur source. But if you're putting a liquid starter on, uh, ATS is not something that you want to put on. It's really, really tough on uh, germinating seed, seedlings. You can kill them pretty quick by doing that. So don't, don't do that. Sulfur doesn't volatilize, which is one of the nice things about it. And so you can put it on top and you don't have a risk of loss like you would if you put urea on top without a, inhibit, a urease inhibitor. So that's all I got for Q&A right now. Let's I know what's going on in the chat. All right, so yeah, this is a million dollar question. Muhammad has a question for you. When you have the time, should growers buy or fertilize now and wait? Any possibility of fertilizer price going down? Your thoughts on availability in the spring? So yeah, so fertilizer is a, has been a roller coaster for the past year or so, and it continues to do that. Right now, the prices are quote unquote lower <laughs> than they were, but they're actually higher than they were the last time this year. I, I would consider the agronomy and the practicality of the fertilization without any regard to what I think is going to happen in six months. Because I certainly don't know what's happening in six months. Um, anything can happen in six months. And right, right now we got the hurricane down in Florida that's going to disrupt phosphate supplies. Also, a lot of the ammonia that comes in from from Trinidad and Tobago, which are big uh, Caribbean ammonia suppliers, they come into the port of Tampa. Well, that's not going to happen for a while. So there's all kinds of stuff that's going on that's going to influence the price. So the Russia-Ukraine thing continues to be an issue. Uh, the the European ammonia manufacturers have started to shut down because they can't get natural gas. Uh, and so that they're going to have to get ammonia from someplace else or Rio, Rio whatever they're, they're you're using. It's kind of a mess right now. So if, if you're a farmer that has 40,000 acres and 20,000 of them need to be fertilized with nitrogen, uh, the practicality of of just putting some on this fall so that you don't have quite that burden in the spring is probably a smart thing. Um, but I wouldn't hold off based on thinking it's going to go down next spring. There's too many things going on that that tell me that that's probably not going to happen. I'm just glad I'm not in the fertilizer business anymore. The In, in the past, you've been able to kind of book and then not really pay for it until spring. That's not going to happen either. Because the fertilizer companies are going to have to book and pay, and so they're going to have to require the farmers to book and pay. And so anything that you you book this fall will have to be paid for this fall. Uh, and I don't think you're going to be able to transfer, okay, I bought ammonia, can I trade that in for the same dollar of urea? Absolutely not. It's not going to happen. I would be shocked if anybody gave that um, option to a farmer i certain i certainly wouldn't do it as a fertilizer dealer not unless i wanted to go bankrupt next year i didn't put a slide up about how to figure out what the cost of say nitrogen is let's say that the cost of ammonia is 1600 dollars and and 1640 a ton let's just say it's 1640 a ton what does that mean in terms of cost cost per pound of nitrogen so what you do is you you figure out how many pounds of nitrogen are in a ton of a product in in ammonia. Uh, it's 8200. The the guaranteed analysis of any fertilizer is a three three number thing. And then if it has sulfur on it, like the ammonium thiol sulfate does, it'll tack it on on the end with a parenthesis that has that nutrient on it. So I told Julianne before she had to leave for another meeting that it was 110027s. 
So the 11 is 11% 11 nitrogen, the zero is 0% 0 P205. The third zero is 0% 0 K2O, it's always that way, NPK, the number, 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 NPK. And then the fourth one had the S in parentheses, so it's 27% sulfur. So if we have 8200, which is the, the guaranteed analysis of ammonia, uh, then that's 82% nitrogen in ammonia. So a ton of ammonia is 2,000 pounds times 0.82 is 1640. So there's a reason I chose $1,640 a ton for ammonia, because if you take 1640 and divide that into 1640, you get one, right? So if you have $1,640 a ton ammonia, that means you have a dollar a pound nitrogen. Right now, it's a little bit less than that, probably 90 cents. Uh, probably around $1,400 a ton, something like that, but you figure it the same way, $1,640 into, into $1,400, whatever the price is, and you get it. Urea, it's $4,600, and so with a ton of ammonia, there's 920 pounds of nitrogen in a ton of urea. So if urea is, I don't know, if, if urea was $920 a ton, just to be simple in my head, that's a dollar a pound. Right now, it's probably more like 800, something like that, which is around 80 cents, I think. But that's how you figure it. That's how you figure all of it. Coming up January 18th, you could put it on your calendar, is the annual soil and soil water workshop at the Fargo Dome. It's the day after the wide world of weeds that Joe Eichley puts on and the rest of the weed department. Uh, they have theirs the day before on Tuesday, and I have mine on Wednesday. So that's January 18th, and then there'll be other opportunities for other presentations across the state uh, this winter for sure. I haven't had a lot of, a lot of requests yet, but I'm sure that'll all change. Mm -hmm.